Well, hi, everybody, and welcome to another great segment in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. And today we bring you Sean Marie Turry and Truth is the New Black which is a thought-provoking fireside style virtual conversation series. It's real talk about business and life and career, about desire and disappointment. You know, basically it's about where all those things intersect and, and it's truth, right? It's, it's where we really live. And Sean Marie is a multi-passionate and multi-talented business strategist who helps businesses get things done and helps leaders lead better. And she is an irrepressible seeker of the truth. As a master design map facilitator, she's taken, that sounded really weird, as a master desire map facilitator. All of a sudden, it did sound like the right words coming out of my mouth. She's taken, okay. taken hundreds of people through her programs, and she is my partner in crime here in the Women Lead Online Forum Series. So, Sean Marie, it's, it's all yours. Tell us what you have for us today. Thank you so, so much, Patty. Uh, I'm so happy to be here and thank you to our guests and thank you to anybody that's listening to our gathering after the fact, but it's really great to be here. And tonight, my special guest is Londi Maduro and Londi is the founder of Blue Child Entertainment. She is a filmmaker and photographer and artist, a model, a mom, a beautiful human being. And she is also the co-founder of women of color filmmakers and uh i want to be i i just want to frame this for everybody so our call goes until 6 30 but londy because she's very in demand these days which is completely understandable she actually has another workshop to teach at 6 p.m for some other fabulous female filmmakers and so she's going to be leaving us at six and then for anybody that wants to stay we'll go ahead and go until 6 30. so londy welcome so much and do you want to tell our our participants and our listeners uh what we are talking about tonight Sure, yeah, so um, basically we're talking about um, hiding out. I think in this um, time right now, you know, before we had this subject on the table way before coronavirus hit, because yes, hiding, out, you know, hiding out is something that um, is very easy for us to do um, normally behind busy work, right? We're like, we're always too busy, we're too busy, you know, I wanna do it, but I, we're too busy, or you're taking on other people's tasks and you're putting aside the things that you know you really should be able to do because it's another form of procrastination. And, you know, with COVID-19, it feels like now that's like a new way of hiding out. We can hide out in our houses and, you know, we don't really have to show up if someone invites us to something on Zoom, which is now the new way to uh, socialize. Um, you can just hide out. And so we're tonight we're just kind of diving into how to get out of that because honestly, I think I heard you mention this in something, Sean Marie, it's really easy to fall into this isolation, um, you know, um, mode where you just kind of isolate yourself from everything and everybody and it's really important that we still stay connected during this time mm -hmm. absolutely honey and it's you know i've seen these memes going around of um it's been primarily men but they're taking pictures of themselves and you know, and you see them from the waist up in their dress, but they don't have any pants on. So, so it's like, so this is now like the new, like the no pants uh, generation. Right. But no, it's it's really, it's really true, Londi. And I'm so happy that you're the person that we're having this conversation with, because with the work that you do as a filmmaker and photographer and videographer, like you have this, first of all, you're incredibly talented. You have such a good eye, but you are the one that gets to really support people in getting out of their way so that their story can come to life. And it's, you know, and, and as you know, Lonnie, like that has been one of the things that I have been working on becoming more comfortable with working through my own insecurities and fears and my, and increasing my tolerance for the discomfort of, of being in front of a, a camera to whatever degree it's a camera, right? Like I feel like what we're doing now is being in front of a camera. And so I've learned uh, in large part, thanks to you, how to begin to build that muscle and take a deep breath and just go for it because of this shifting tide. And this whole idea of, you know, hiding out in our aloneness or hiding out in our solitude. And, you know, I, 
one of the reasons that Patty and Michelle and I do these online forums is to really create a space where people can come forward and be like, gosh, I'm really glad somebody asked that question because the truth is I'm not very comfortable and I am kind of scared and this does feel vulnerable and this is really hard or I am really angry about whatever the topic may be. And so what I'd really love, Londi, is if you could speak a little bit to some of the ways that you are supporting your tribe and your clients and even how you've helped me, like what your approach is to helping people get on the other side of that discomfort, uh, you know, maybe take their iPhone and make some goofy little videos on their own, or if they're at a place in their business where they've been wanting to take a next step with a professional like you and, you know, and say, gosh, you know, I'm, I don't need like an in-house photographer, but I, I need to like, I need to start to update some things. What would you say to them? And is there a way that they could actually do some of this work with you now, even virtually, you know, because, and I just want to say really quickly, you helped me make a video four, five weeks ago now um, for our On the Threshold event, which you were my special guest. And I didn't even know you could do that. And I've tried doing it three times since, and it's not working, so I obviously need you. But you have, you have, you are still able to help people and support people in your line of work, even if it can't be in real life. So I'd love it if you'd speak a little bit to that, Wandy, please. Sure, well, I think most of it is just getting past the mental block of doing something that's uncomfortable. Um, we all know that, you know, to step out and be successful, se successful, you have to get out of your comfort zone. And for many people who are used to doing business a certain way, being in front of the camera is uncomfortable. Um, I have a lot of clients who even when I was able to, you know, be with them and take their pictures, they stiffen up. It's like, I always joke and say it's like picture day in school. You know, as soon as they see that camera and, and you say, okay, well, let's smile and go like this. I'm like, okay, relax. <laughs> it's really okay. I promise I'm not going to bite you. <laughs> so most of this is getting past being uncomfortable and doing something that's different, that's out of your comfort zone. And even with you, it's, you know, one, um, practice. If you're now having to do a lot of tutorials, like most of us are trying to find ways to turn our business virtually and do tutorials, then practice um, what you're going to say. Not necessarily memorize it, but just practice it. Maybe try with some friends. You know, um, or if you bored your friends to death with it with your business, then put <laughs> like something that you enjoy. As that, and I keep pointing, forgetting you guys can't see, but next to my camera, if I put a little sticker of something that makes me happy, maybe if it's an affirmation, and talk directly to that. Like as I'm looking at that, it looks like I'm looking at you guys, but I'm really looking at my camera, you know, or something next that would be next to my camera. So doing finding little tricks that get you. Um, out of your discomfort so that you can be more natural. And so then all of a sudden you're not developing these weird twitches that we sometimes get. Like sometimes people find they blink a lot. <laughs> you know? I know I'm a head nodder. I'm like, I look at videos of myself. Like, oh my God, I did not know that I do that when people. <laughs> oh, I do that too. <laughs> so you start to learn all these little things that you do, but we all have them. And so just letting go and being natural and being natural in front of the camera, you will find that one, people appreciate it. It's genuine. I think one time we were talking, um, your cat or your dog hopped in your lap and you don't try to freak out because it happens. You're just like, okay, yep. They want to say hi. Okay. We're going to put him down and now we're going to get back to it because this is life and we all understand it. So just getting out of your um, discomfort and trying little tricks that work for you. I highly recommend you don't practice in a mirror, like if you're going to practice what you're going to say, because in a mirror, we self-correct, right? Of course. And so, but then when you do it in front of the camera, like if you just use your phone and, and do it, then all of a sudden you're like, well, I wasn't doing that when I was doing it in the mirror. <laughs> in the mirror, you're going to correct. So I would definitely practice by recording it and then playing it back. And then you can start working on those things and they'll become natural when you're talking to people online. So I would definitely say that's the first step. So Lonnie, honey, I want to ask you for some Zoom etiquette, since <laughs> if, if, if you don't mind, because you made a really great point about the camera, because I don't know if you're looking at me or Lizzie or Diego or Patty, but it looks, I feel like you're looking directly at me, which is, which is pretty great. And I'm going to guess that everyone else thinks that you're looking at them. 
and it probably is them. No, I'm just kidding. But, but the beauty of it again, because you're a pro and you know where to look. So for me, I have the Brady box bunch. I mean the Brady bunch boxes up, right? So right now I'm looking at you, which is a uh, second square from the left uh, and, and down one. Mm -hmm. I, anyway, I don't even know if that makes sense, but you're down here, but my camera is up here. Right. So is there any etiquette that you can share with us specifically with making videos of like, you know, where do we look? Because I've, I've seen some of the videos back and I'm like totally looking over here because that's where the person was in the grid. Um, so I don't know, like, do, do you have any feedback for that? Yes. It, doesn't even, it doesn't even matter. I'm so glad you asked that because I've seen some crazy ones too where people have had it <laughs> down in their lap and they don't realize we're looking up their nose, which is, I don't care how pretty you are, that is not a good look. Hi, <laughs> honey, I'm with you. I'm like, gosh, did they not know? Like, I know. <laughs> and I, I've, I've seen some other things other than just up in somebody's <laughs> nose hair, but yeah. <laughs> It's like, oh, we, where's Londi to give us a tutorial? So I would say the first thing is um, you usually have that problem with what you're suggesting. Your, your, your uh, camera is higher than your monitor. So if you don't want that, if you want it to feel like you're speaking directly to your audience, then you will have to bring your camera down closer to the monitor. That way it will look like you are looking into the camera. So right now I'm using my laptop and that camera is on the top of it, so it looks more like I'm looking the camera, but unfortunately, if your camera's here and your monitor's there, then it's gonna look like you're looking down, talking to people. So you okay. would wanna try to move um, your camera down or move your monitor up, but you wanna try to get them level, so that way it looks like you're speaking directly to camera. That would be my first thing. So I'm on an iMac, so the camera is in the computer, but it's sitting on, a little riser that's probably about three inches maybe two inches mm -hmm. so i'm wondering if i put my mac directly on my desk then my camera is probably going to be right about here right so is that ideal yeah that is ideal if you want like in some these forms are a little more loose so it doesn't matter but if you're really engaging your clients and if you want them to feel like you're speaking to them then i would yes. recommend that you bring your monitor and camera to the same level Mm -hmm. So is, is that a good level also for like the best neck angle and the best, like, <laughs> is this my good side? <laughs> yes. I level, okay. you know, I was just teaching this in my director's uh, work, uh, class. I level is always, um, it's non-threatening and it's conversational. If you know okay. those interviews, the news, everything like that is always at eye level. Oh, you're so, right. So eye level is the level that most documentaries, everything is eye level. So when you're speaking and you want people to engage, you want to be at eye level, correct? Okay. And I want to mention something about lighting while we're talking about that. Please, yes. Um, what I've noticed too a lot of times is people will have a bright window behind them and nothing lighting their face. You, if you sit like me, all my windows are actually behind me. So I actually tilted my camera so you're not getting glare. I turned it to, at an angle. But I have a light above me and a light on this side of me so that I'm lit a little more evenly. Otherwise, because my office is very bright, I would be kind of silhouetted, especially because I'm wearing black too. That wouldn't help. But the difference between me turning that light off oh. versus me turning that light on adds significantly. Wow. So I want to make sure you get, and then I have a big ring light above me that's lighting my face. Yeah, I saw he just turned his light. <laughs> he did. It's like, where'd he go? <laughs> so you want to be, if you're I really- I also have a light in front of me and in the yes. back. Exactly. So if you're sitting, if your light source is behind you, it's going to cause you to be silhouetted if you don't have something to offset it. Right. Um, so if you're engaging like clients in a professional matter, I will highly recommend you get a ring light. They're not expensive. You can get one on Amazon. Um, they have different sizes now. They have small ones that are like 50, 60, 70 bucks and just mount it. I have, I, and I actually have a workman's light that like you would um, use in, uh, uh, in the garage or something. One of those bowl ones that you get from Home Depot. That's what's yes. I would take it down, but it's too much work to put it up. <laughs> <laughs> I have it mounted on a light stand, really cheap. I think it was five dollars. So you don't want to be expensive, but you do want something to offset the brightness and that you're lit evenly because otherwise it's distracting. People start to tune out, especially if they can't see you. Mm -hmm. you know? Exactly. Londi, have you watched any of the episodes of Black AF? 
Not yet, no. <laughs> oh my God. Okay. My husband and I are completely and utterly obsessed, but their second oldest daughter, I guess the middle daughter, she wants to go to NYU film school. And so her dad, who's like a gazillionaire, um, so he sets up this whole thing for her to create this documentary, but the lighting, that that's what I want to talk about. When you get a chance to watch it, um, and we have our next conversation about this, I almost feel like, Blondie, like this should be a series. Like we, <laughs> no, I'm really serious. Like I think that there are some I think that there are some dynamics that you and I could create together to create a little series of, um, of people being able to not only connect to their truth and bring that to the surface, but then how they get that conveyed on film. Anyway, it's home that I'm off topic, but they have this really um, ornate, what I'm assuming is probably really expensive setup, but I, at some point it would be really fun to speak to that. And I also wanted to bring that to your attention with your school, with the, with your clients and the other filmmakers and, you know, do they really need all of that? I mean, plus it's just, it's, it's so brilliantly written and it's just, it's, yeah, it's great. So I can't wait till you watch it, but I digress. So um, it is 10 minutes to six, Londi. And so I'd love to do one of two things. And that is to ask Lizzie or Diego if they have any questions in the next 10 minutes that you could answer. And if they don't, Londi, then I'd like to defer to you and just find out like, what are some of the things that you are doing? Because even though you are so beautiful and smart and talented and you do this great work and you're a videographer and a photographer and um, we all are hiding out in a sense, or at least pushing back against that and resisting the temptation to hide out. So I'd, I'd love for you to speak to some of the things that you've been doing um, for your own self-care and to stay present and um, engaged. Sure. Um, definitely having a tribe, like what you were doing in regards to on the threshold, things like this, like having people, I didn't realize how much I needed that until it was immediately cut off. And so for me, um, definitely connected women of influence is that for me on the business side, from the creative side, it's my organization, women of color filmmakers. Like they were like, Wandi, what are we doing? Are we, are we going to do something? So now we're doing a filmmakers challenge. We have a quarantine filmmakers challenge where Fantastic. everyone has to shoot a film on their own in quarantine. And if you're using actors, you have to um, direct them through zoom or through your phones. Cause you're not allowed to physically go over to their house. Oh, yeah. So we, you know, it, it definitely put me back in the zone and it's important to have that you need to have a tribe because all of a sudden you're by yourself and or even if you have family they're on your nerves you know what I mean? like, oh yes they're like, you know they're, anyways that's a whole nother story <laughs> but um and, we'll and do that's another series Lonnie. Right. and so all of a sudden now you're like I, I didn't realize how much i needed that support system so finding being a tribe now, there's so many available virtually. I know what you're doing, Shamari, is awesome on the threshold. Finding thank that you. place to be supported is very important. Honey, thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And uh, Diego and Lizzie, I'll make sure that you get Londi's uh, contact information after today. Uh, but Lizzie, did you have a question or Diego? Uh, we've got about eight minutes left with Londi. I have a question. Sure. So I, uh, <clears throat> I want to ask. Uh, I know you say you use some uh, resources to, but when you are talking to the camera like I am doing right now, mm -hmm. uh, do you visualize? Do you use anything punctually uh, to? Uh, feel comfortable while talking to a black hole? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So it really depends on your comfort level. Um, because I do have a background in acting, I personally don't, but I do like to pretend like I'm talking to a friend. So even like I have to script out everything because I always feel like I'm going to forget like for my class tonight, these are all my notes. Like it's just mm -hmm. ridiculous. Um, if I'm doing two camera stuff, sometimes I'll put my notes right next to my monitor. Um, but I pretend like I'm talking to a friend 
because I'm very silly, I will probably laugh a lot. I'll probably do crazy. <laughs> like, it's just, I like to pretend like I'm talking to a friend and that gets me out of it. However, if you need, put a stuffed animal there. And if you feel really silly, that's fine. You know, put whatever you need. You know, these have those little trolls with the crazy hair that sticks up. If you got any of those, you know, put something next to your computer that you can talk to. And even though you may feel silly, it's going to feel silly because it's not a real person. Um, after a while, you will get more comfortable. You'll start to relax a little bit. But it takes practice. Okay. It definitely takes practice. Okay. And I will tell you, when I record like my tutorials, I probably mess up. All of a sudden, it's like I can't speak English anymore. You know, you get tongue twisted and you're like, oh, that's not what I meant to say. The version that you see, I've probably reshot four times. You know what I mean? So that's natural. Yeah. That's natural. Now, if I'm speaking to a live audience and I mess up, then I'll just acknowledge the mess up, you know? But if it's something I'm recording, I retape it. That's the beauty of recording yourself. You can mm -hmm. take it again. <laughs> um, unlike Facebook Live. <laughs> right. Unlike Facebook Live. <laughs> All right. Thank I hope you. that answers your question. No problem. <laughs> Thank you, Londi. No problem. Lizzie, did you have a question for Londi? Yeah, um, kind of on the vein of um, video or filming etiquette that you're talking about. So we're starting to do some videos from home now for social media for my business um, or organization um, that we would have either done in like our office or something like that, um, where we have branding and everything. And so I was wondering um, if there are any kind of etiquette things around uh, like personal photos being in those shots or like decorations around the house or something if it's something like this like I don't care I'm in my living room right now too so you can't really see anything but <laughs> I you know for some of those videos I've been like taking down photos and I'm kind of thinking like do I need to do this should I really be doing this and that's an excellent question yeah that's an excellent question so it really does go to your branding and it depends on what you're shooting i think for the more casual videos right now covid 19 is letting you get away with a lot of that however if you're trying to make sure you're staying true to your brand and being very professional then you do want to carve out an area in your house that matches your brand if there's no place in your house that does that i would highly recommend you get an inexpensive backdrop you can get them on Amazon. They have ones that look like office facades. A matter of fact, um, uh, we do a show at Connected Women of Influence that looks like we're in a New York high rise. Normally we shoot those at National University in Costa Mesa. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks like we're somewhere really professional. We come in with all that gear and set that up. So if you, um, and I'll be happy, I am giving consultations to people who need some advice and some strategies on how to set up their, their home for shooting themselves. And I can help you with lighting tips and picking the best backdrops and how to light yourself and how if you're using something as a teleprompter, how to do it so your eye line looks natural. I've been helping people with that. But you do want to try to stay true to your brand when you're shooting your more professional videos, for sure. Beautiful. No problem. Londi, thank you so much, honey. It is 557. So I want to be super mindful and honor your time and the next workshop you need to get to. So uh, again, I will make sure that actually I think Diego has your, anyway, but I'll send it again. Okay. Uh, Lizzie, make sure that I have your email address, darling, and I'll send that to you. But is there anything that you'd like to, any parting words as they say, Londi? I just want to say thank you for having me. I'm so sorry I wasn't able to stay longer, but I, I really enjoy things like this. They make my day. So thank you so much. And um, thank you, Patty. Thank you, Sean Marie. And if there's anything I can do for you guys, please don't hesitate to let me know. Oh, honey, you're going to be so sorry you said that because I got, I got a list. <laughs> but honey, go have a great night with the ladies. Um, I can't wait to see what you're all creating together. And I love you, Londi, and I'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Love you guys okay. too. Bye-bye. Bye, honey. So uh, I wanted to share something that I thought was really, um, was really interesting. And Lizzie, I'd love to hear uh, a little bit from you and from Diego about um, maybe some of the ways that, you know, well, if this topic resonated with you, why was that? You know, just this idea of um, how hiding out is not serving us. And if you found any ways to begin to 
come out of the hiding a little bit um, and just tell us a little bit about your work. But I wanted to share this with you. And, and we get to do this because it's a really sweet, intimate group. So this isn't always the case. So I'm, I'm grateful for it when it happens. Okay, so this is, uh, I just, um, Lizzie, I, I started a live gathering five weeks ago called On the Threshold, and it's every Thursday at noon and at six. And last week was inspired by this book, How to Be an Artist by Jerry Saltz. And uh, it was uh, a conversation that Jerry had with Chef uh, David Chang. And uh, Jerry is the senior art critic for the New Yorker magazine, and he won a Pulitzer last year, I believe it was. So this is chapter 37 in his book, How to Be an Artist. Number 37, make art for now, not the future. Every time I sit down to write, I'm doing it for now, for you, the reader. I'd like my work to survive, but that's, but that's not what's driving me. What I want is for it to be in the conversation, in the always changing now. That's why I write every week. My wife, Roberta, says writing weekly is like performing on stage. The work we do is written in the heat and it is published at once. That kind of immediacy is focusing, it's energizing, it goads you on, and it keeps us moving, and it keeps us humble. If you think that all art should be high, high Renaissance painting or like a Van Gogh or an Eva Hess or a Basquiat, think again. Human beings are hardwired to crave change. I'm gonna say that again. Human beings are hardwired to crave change. The universe is expanding and so are we and so is art, which doesn't mean it's getting better or worse, only that art was once all contemporary, in conversation with its time, and your art is too. Every choice you make, your medium, processes, colors, shapes, and images should serve not nostalgia, but your visceral present. You are an artist of modern life. That personal specific urgency is what fuels every successful work of art. And I wanted to share that because for me anyway, a lot of the hiding or resistance or procrastination is completely dismantled when I read something like that, right? That it's, it really is about this now. And one of the things we talked about last week was that Jerry talked about this radical vulnerability uh, in this conversation that he'd had with David Chang. And, and the way that radical vulnerability showed up for him is that he, he's basically illiterate. He was a long haul truck driver for 40 years. He doesn't have a degree. He knows no, he has no, no background in art history. He's not an artist himself. And yet he is an art critic. So he critiques art. He critiques the art of other people and then gets a ton of shit about it. So where his radical vulnerability shows up is that when he writes a piece, a critique, he opens the conversation up, which is when he's talking about, I want to be in the conversation now, is that he opens that dialogue up to anyone. Like he is open for the punches, but he has a standard that he sets for his entire community and tribe. And that is that they can say anything to him. They can call him any name of the book. They can go toe to toe with him and disagree with his critique, but they cannot attack one another. They cannot take pot shots at other people in the tribe, at other people in the conversation. And I just thought, gosh, that is somebody who is taking a platform and in a medium, which millions and millions of people are on. And he's making a very specific decision about how he is not going to hide how he is going to be upfront and vulnerable and take the conversation with the tribe in his way to a higher level. And one of his criteria is that he will engage absolutely anybody except cynics. He will take all criticizers, but he refuses to deal with cynics. And cynics for him, and in my opinion as well, are essentially people who just participate in recreational rage. They get angry just for the sake of being angry. It's not because of their love of art. It's because he's Jewish or he's illiterate. Like what it just, there, there's no backbone to it. 
But what I'd love to do is talk to all of us in this little community platform um, about what your artistry is and what radical vulnerability means to you and what we can create right now in the now to be part of the conversation now without worrying about legacy, without worrying about likes or subscribers or members or what have you, but what can we create or, or Diego and Lizzie, maybe for you and you too, Patty, um, is what is it that you are craving that you would love to be making right now, but maybe that's one of the areas where you've been hiding out and what can we do collectively to support you? So I'd like to hear from you. So for me, um, yes, I, well, I talk largely with with Jean Marie, but for you, Patty and Lizzie, I have a background in, in engineering and starting to put in myself out there as a coach or emotional supporting or sharing my thoughts, my emotions, uh, something that had been largely numbed for me and so speaking my truth my sharing my feelings and that's kind of radical vulnerability to me mm -hmm. because i i learned always to not uh, acknowledge my feelings and well that uh have been a, <clears throat> like a, a long journey to me and it is to to acknowledge that and to really coming back to myself so for me it's kind of a big move uh to share <laughs> like i'm i am doing now so i am practicing <laughs> and yes just uh speaking for myself or, or sharing my thoughts uh, for in my lifetime it's been a, uh, has been a, my comfort zone. So I am putting myself out of that, of my comfort zone to, yeah, to just speak what I think, what I think it, it's true or it's true for me. Mm. Good for you, you Diego. Know, I, I'd like to to say something to you, Diego. In, a, in another life, I managed software developers, engineers, project managers, and so forth. And I found them to be incredibly creative and incredibly mm. emotional when you gave them permission to be so. Because just the very act of writing software, writing code, you're building something out of nothing, which is incredibly creative. And, and often they hadn't even thought about that until I told them that. And, mm. you know, there's this, um, uh, this stigma, if you will, or, or a, um, I, what's the word I'm looking for? But it's like we always assume engineers are cold and, mm. you know, it's all ones and O's and want, you know, on and off and so forth. And it isn't that way at all. I, I honestly found them to be the most creative, heartfelt, um, warm people ever. And, and we, we built great stuff together. We had a great time together. So I think you should be um, really proud of yourself for stepping into what really is, is real don't believe the lie that you're told that this is the way engineers are because it's not, nobody is this way, you know? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think the, the really tough things here for me is, as you said, the, the creative part mm -hmm. to, yeah. Yeah. You give me the clue. <laughs> Yeah, I think that the creative is connecting with your emotion. Mm -hmm. That is where creation starts. Mm -hmm. mm. 
You know, I, I just want to read this one line again really quickly. Um, the work we do is written in the heat and published at once. That kind of immediacy is focusing, it is energizing, it goads you on, and it keeps you moving, and it keeps you humble. Um, mm. So all of these like mental gymnastics that we take ourselves through and all of the bemoaning and hand wringing like, oh my God, is it perfect or is it ready? And I just, oh my gosh, I was like the idea of writing something or creating something or taking a photo um, and maybe not even doing any touch up on it or taking a selfie, one, not 51. Um, I just, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm just like having this moment of feeling like, oh my God, I bet that's liberating. Like it could also, like you were saying, like it can also be radically vulnerable to just be like, oh, I'm just going to put this out there and I think it's really crappy and it's not really done. But um, I don't know. It just, I kind of like revs me up a little bit. I'm like, God, oh, that could, that could feel liberating. So yeah, I just, I wanted to reshare that again. That I thought that was really powerful. Yeah, that also resonates with me. The um, writing for the now, for being the conversation. I don't know if it will last or whatever, or it will be out there one day and then vanished, whatever. Uh, and that's I I also I I felt that the, that liberation also. Just, I write, I put out there, be in the conversation and. Tomorrow I will write another thing and go on. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Diego. Lizzie, right. honey, what about you? How are how are things going for you, and how is it, this resonating with you? Yeah, I um, for me, what I thought about initially when you were reading that passage and and talking about it a little bit. Um, so I work in the nonprofit sector, and um, we provide resources to the community and a little bit different but um it just in general i think my whole life the the best teams i've had and when i've been a best leader for my teams have been when i've created kind of a culture like you were talking about that art critic has and where it's we can all be open and say things and i'll take all the feedback but there's no in between between anyone else on the team and no one else to my team and i think that just has stuck out to me because that's been like a you create like a bubble where you can be vulnerable and that's when the best work comes out and the best ideas and people are, are comfortable doing that and you can get creative and you don't get stuck in the same thing all the time just because that's how we've done it and mm. I've been on teams where that hasn't been the atmosphere and I feel like those are the times I was the most stagnant and like didn't want to be there and would hide more because I was like I, they're just not as interested um, but I also think about, um, like that being vulnerable in that way. Um, for me, part of what I do is sharing my personal story all the time. So I, I work for, I work, um, with Komen, uh, the breast cancer, uh, foundation. And so, um, I have a personal tie. I lost my mom to breast cancer and that's what got me into this. And I've been advocating lobbying for 10 plus years. And that's like a story I have to tell all the time. Um, and that used to be like really vulnerable for me and it's not anymore. And now what is more so is taking that kind of um, history and established um, viewpoints from an organization and a story I've already been telling for a long time um, and kind of speaking out differently sometimes. And, and that whole writing in the moment and it's for now and I wanna be in the conversation today, um, especially right now. <laughs> Yes. in the healthcare sphere, um, it changes every single day. And so being willing to speak up like that and bring up something that can have a huge beneficial impact um, can seem really scary and vulnerable, but this especially is the time to do it. Mm. Um, and so for me, that was really captivating thinking about that. Like how often do I not speak up and say something just because I don't know what the climate's going to be like tomorrow or what the people around me are going to think about my opinion because I know it's going to differ from theirs. Um, yet it's at a time where we need everyone to be doing that the most. So um, that was kind of where I went when you were talking about that. Lizzie, I, I'm so grateful that you said that because we do need 
these amazing, creative, unique voices right now. And the beauty is, is that it's not meant for everybody, right? Like what, what I have to say in Diego, you know, he and I were talking about this earlier today is if we can remove the worry for the audience that we are hoping will hear it and we simply trust that it's for those that need to hear it, that are ready to hear it, and that the message will, I know this is a little esoteric, but that the message will make its way energetically out in the world to whoever it is meant for. We don't know who's listening. We don't know who's sharing. We don't know who is reposting. Um, we don't, like, we have no idea. And Lizzie, I've heard you speak and, and your story, and it's really beautiful and it's really powerful. And you are absolutely right, my friend. We need these voices more now than ever because the, the more of us that are having these, you know, talks around, you know, kind of up-leveling your consciousness and being more aware and being kinder and being more present in the moment, you know, the more that that drowns out and makes less space for the cynics. And heaven knows that there are a lot of them out there and, you know, the world isn't perfect and we all don't agree. But I feel like what we can agree on is that we really are all connected, you know, and that is my point of view. And some people agree and some people think that that's really provocative, but we all have our opinion. And I think it is, you know, deservedly at least has an opportunity to be spoken and put out into the world. And I, and I feel that way, even about those who I viscerally disagree with. But again, I, I don't think it is about drowning them out or trying to say, I know best, or, you know, I think that this group should have the right to do this, but not that group. I don't think it's about trying to shut them down. I think it's about elevating above. And for those of us, and it's, again, especially with what you're talking about, Lizzie, like that voice and that conversation, um, there are way too many people, unfortunately, that need to be elevated in that way. And, you know, maybe one day that will change and the odds will turn around and these cures will be discovered, which would be a beautiful thing. But we need you right now. We really do. We need you, Lizzie. We need your voice. Diego, we need your voice. Um, you know, in a time of such, you know, and we've talked about this, and Patty and I have talked about this, this, you know, this toxic masculinity, and that is not to say, like, I love the masculine energy. I, you know, we, we all have both the yin and the yang, the feminine and the masculine, um, but elevating the masculine energy, which has been, right, kind of the the rule of law for ever. Um, and we need less toxicity in the masculine decisions that are being made on this planet. And I think that you are part of that next wave, Diego, and part of that movement. So we need you too, my friend. And Patty, I don't know if you would like to share. Um, we've got 15 minutes left, but Patty, is also doing really incredible work in the world and and it also comes from a deeply personal place and um it is time patty for for you as well my friend especially people are walking a pretty fine line right now in a lot of ways and i know you know what i mean so um patty would you like to share at all how, sure. how you're doing I, and it really it struck me what you said lizzie about um you know, sharing something and wondering who's, how's it going to land with certain people and what are they going to say? And some people aren't going to agree and so forth. And, um, I, uh, I'm very active in the recovery movement, uh, for those with substance use disorder. And, um, it's an interesting thing because not only are you fighting the social stigma that goes with that, where, where people will say, you know, very uninformed things like it was their choice or, um, you know, they did this to themselves, that kind of thing. So that's, that's one thing that you fight. But then even within the recovery community, don't use this term, don't use these words, don't use this, you know, so that when I'm writing 
um, for my blog or for, for other publications in that space, I began to find myself self-correcting. Oh, don't say that. No, no, that's going to, you know, that, that puts a whole different spin on Don't say that, you know, you got, oh, you got to change this. And, and I was asked to write something for Mother's Day um, by an organization. And I was, you know, I am a mom and I did lose somebody to this. And, and someone I love is still in the grip of that. So I kind of know what I'm talking about, you know, and as I was writing it, I started to go to that place about, oh, don't use that term. Don't, and, and I finally was sort of like, you know what, screw that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. I know how to reach those moms who feel like I do, you know, whether it's substance use disorder or it's, it's mental illness or it's homelessness or it's whatever. These are the things that we struggle with, with our loved ones. And when I freed myself to write it, it just came, you know, and I, I sent it to the person who had requested it and she wrote me back like immediately. She goes, great. I'm crying and I have to get on a zoom call. Like what have you done to me? And I thought, bingo, I, I hit the mark, you know, and, and it's the same thing with social media. You know, you put something out there and then somebody attacks you for some lame ass reason. And, and I just don't engage. If you want to fight about that, that's your fight. That's not my fight. I'm not going to fight with you. And I, I'm, I'm not going to get in the ring with that. And this is what I know. This is my experience. This is my belief system. You can't argue with somebody's belief system. You know, it, it is what it is. And it takes a level of bravery and vulnerability. You said that, Shamri, that's the key word, vulnerability to say, here it is. I'm not really asking you to, to drink this Kool-Aid. Just respect the fact that it's mine, you know. Mm. Thank you so much, Patty. And, you know, when you were talking, Patty, I was reminded of something that, that Londi said earlier, and she was talking about um, getting over your discomfort mm -hmm. or um, getting a hold of it, or um, I can't remember exactly how she framed it, but I wanted to suggest that instead of trying to get rid of it, uh, one of my teachers, um, he says, let's party with it. <laughs> I haven't completely embraced that concept, but what I have done is I've increased my tolerance for it um, because it doesn't go away. And this particular teacher of mine is an actor and he's been acting for, oh my gosh, I don't know, probably 40 years and he's now a teacher. And so when I go to these workshops and I've been working with him for about nine years, I am usually one of maximum three non-actors and there's a maximum of 22 people in the class. So there I am with my fellow entrepreneur or stay at home mom amongst all of these actors and comedians. And the first time I went to Josh's class, uh, I walked in and I'm with all of these gorgeous, girls and guys and the girls are like a size zero or a size two and I'm like oh my god I've seen her on that show and I saw him in that commercial and I immediately felt uh exposed and I was like I made the biggest mistake I shouldn't be here I'm not an actor I'm such an idiot what did I do and within a half an hour of everybody getting up and taking two minutes to introduce themselves what I realized was that these beautiful, skinny, young girls, some of them were older, but they were all like, of course, like I'm comparing myself to them. Um, we all felt exactly the same way. You know, one girl got up there and she's like, I swear to God, if I lose another role to Sandra Bullock, like I'm going to just fucking quit. Like, what's the point? Um, I'm never going to get hired because I'm like the second rate Sandra Bullock. Um, and, you know, them hearing from agents and casting directors that they have to lose weight or fix their teeth or straighten their hair, just like all of this BS. And, you know, and I shared this with uh, Diego earlier today, and I'm going to share it again because I think it's just so beautiful and it's very poignant to what we are, what we're talking about. Uh, but it says the real glow is when you stop waiting to turn into someone perfect, some version of yourself, and consciously enjoy being who you are in the present. And so 
that is the invitation I want to put out to all of us collectively and all of those who aren't with us tonight, but they're, you know, just sending out that vibe that we can be this, the most true version of ourselves right here in this moment and tomorrow when we do that blog or push out that newsletter or we take a vulnerable risk of exposing a truth and sharing with our tribe, with the world, with one other person for no other reason than that is what's on our heart, that it is really our deepest truth. And, and I think if like Jerry, if we are willing to be, to practice radical vulnerability and put our truth out there and be open to the conversation, but have it be a hard no for any cynics, like, I mean, what do we really have to lose? Mm -hmm. Right. And I, and I know that all four of us and those amongst in our circles and our communities, we have something really special to bring to the world. And how unfortunate would that be if we didn't do something with this, with these ideas and this creativity and we did it for the now, we did it for this moment, for this time in the world. Um, I think it's really, and like he said, um, human beings crave change. It's like, oh my God, well, I mean, we couldn't, like the, the stage could not have been any better set than right now. Like we are in the midst of a global change that is now getting heated and like it's getting constricted again in this whole conversation about are we going to open the country, or are we not? So, so we're back to this like push-pull and my hope and my desire is that we can just continue to stay in our own work in the practice of staying present of taking care of ourselves in the best way that we can in whatever way that means for us mm -hmm. and focus on the next best thing focus on what are we birthing today and then tomorrow we'll think about what are we birthing tomorrow and that we take just one step and then another and then another and then another toward this work that we're meant to be doing in the world and that we and you know this is what i want to say and if we need help that we ask for it if we need a nudge if we need a vote of confidence if we need some encouragement if we need somebody to hold our hand virtually while we're making our first video um or if we need somebody to jump onto facebook and like what we posted like how about if we just ask for just one thing that we need, you know, I mean, that, that takes radical vulnerability too. Mm -hmm. you know, to ask for something that we need, like, Hey, I really need some help. And, and that's okay. And I think that we owe it to ourselves to ask for it. Mm -hmm. So does anybody else have anything that you'd like to share? We've got about five more minutes. Uh, another thing that Sherry says is uh, make your work in a way only you can make it. And I think oh. that goes for uh, what Patty says, that, that uh, self-correction, uh, mm. the, the, the authenticity is, well, be ourselves, the truest, <clears throat> and we all we are all unique, unique beings. Mm, that we are, Diego. And Diego, would you just repeat that again? What Jerry said, because I thought that was so. It was so simple and so beautiful. Make your work in a way only you can make it. That's right. Mm. You know, and he talks about uh, Jackson Pollock and the fact that when people started mm -hmm. looking at Jackson's work, especially after he passed away, uh, the splatter work, you know, people were like, anybody could do that. And one of the things that Jerry said, which I thought was so beautiful was, yeah, but you didn't. <laughs> he did, right? He did. And Jerry talks about him that he, he, 
created himself into newness. Like he was, um, as a lot of artists are, he was definitely a bit mad and manic and, um, he wasn't, uh, mentally, he definitely struggled a lot with his, you know, mental and emotional well being. but, um, but no one else did. Right. And it's so like, mm -hmm. how often do we like, Oh, well, anybody could do that. It's like, yeah, but you're not. Yeah. Anybody could do a podcast. Anybody like get a cheap, like it doesn't even have to be the best equipment. Anybody could do it. Anybody could write a blog, but are we doing it? Yep. Right. So I was just like, Oh man, like, you know, brick to my forehead. Um, so I thought that was really, it's like, yeah, but are you? And, and instead of like, Jerry was like, yeah, you could make a Pollock, but you did like he did it first. But I think if we take that same sentiment and we add some compassion to it and we change it a little bit and say, yes, then why don't you? Like, oh, I could write a blog or I could do what the Kardashians are doing or I could be an influencer. Or I could take selfies. It's like, okay, then what's stopping you? Then why don't you do it? Then how can I help you do it? Because that's where the rubber meets the road. Right. And so again, like just this kind of, not again, I didn't say this. So I don't know why I said again, but probably because I've said it a million times in my lifetime, but uh, I think it was Oprah or Jim Rohn. I don't know who said it, but that we become, we become most like the five people that we spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. So I think too, being mindful and being protective over this thing that we want to bring into the world and consider the five people that are closest to us. And I'm not suggesting that anybody abandon their friends or go get a new crew. Um, but what I am saying is if those five people that you are at the moment closest to, if they tend to be naysayers, if they tend to be suspicious, if they tend to be overly cautious, if they tend to be negative, if they tend to be Debbie Downers, if they tend to nay say something that they didn't think of first, if they are anything less than supportive, then find another tribe to have this conversation with. Then find another group who will love you and champion you and tell you the truth and support you to the nth degree and will lift you up even if they themselves are waiting to be lifted. Mm -hmm. That is the group and the tribe that you want to be having these kinds of creative, vulnerable, open-hearted conversations with. It is, it is essential to your well-being and to not only the support of getting it off the ground, but the support of sustaining it. Because until we can build our own muscle of confidence and our own sense of radical self-well-being and self-love and self-care, we have to rely on our tribe. We have to rely on our communities. We have to rely on our ride or die will kick our ass, will love us when we're, when we drink too much and we're throwing up in the toilet and, you know, when it, those three, 3 a.m. phone call, you know, all of it, like, that's what we want. And again, that's not to say to do away with, with the people that are, that are in our lives that maybe aren't capable of that, but I am definitely encouraging the growth of your tribe so that you have that, like, mm, and we deserve it. And if you don't have it, give me a call and, or start a group of your own, but this is, this is as essential as toilet paper. So. <laughs> you know, I, I like what you said about, or, or actually what the author said about, yeah, but you didn't because there's so many critics out there. There's so, especially right now, everyone's got an opinion and everybody feels the need to speak it out, you know, and, and have their right that, there's a, uh, you've probably read it before, but um, Theodore Roosevelt, The Man in the Arena. Oh, that's um, beautiful. Oh my God, it is, it is still probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever read, where it's, it's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how, how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done him better. The credit belongs to the man who's actually in the arena. Mm -hmm. that, that has always spoken to me when when people want to criticize, it's like, well, at least I was there. At least I was trying. Well, Absolutely. where were you? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And again, I think the way that Jerry has created this juxtaposition with the role of the critic, mm -hmm. right? That is, he won a Pulitzer for his critical review. Um, 
it critic is in the name of what he does. Mm -hmm. right. So, but the fact that he took this thing that the connotation of it is negative and he has opened it up to a conversation. It's like, and again, this is a guy that had what it looked like on the surface, no business even thinking he could be an art critic, let alone actually applying and having the audacity and the ballsiness to go and put himself in the line of fire to be like, hey, truck driver Joe here, Jewish Joe. That was his thing is that he's like, I was a long haul truck driver until I was 40. He said, I think I was the only Jewish long haul truck driver. <laughs> um, but like, I mean, he just like went, I'm going to go for it. Like he had that moment of clarity, that epiphany where he's like, yeah, I'm not going to wait any longer. And he's 62 years old now and he still wakes up afraid every day that his best writing is behind him and that they're not there that tomorrow they're going to find out what a fraud he is. So he's right. So th this is what we, we take this with us into, you know, into the next, whatever the next is until our last breath. Um, and that's why we just keep showing up and doing the work and we love each other and one another until we can love ourselves and beyond that. And we support one another so that we can get out there and put our hand up and say, I'm a long haul truck driver who can't read. I have no art history, but right. So this is really about what art are we creating mm -hmm. after this call tonight, tomorrow and beyond. So I love you guys. And I'm going to leave you with this. This is called, uh, so this is from Jerry's book. I need my glasses. They might steam up because it's 100 degrees in here and I have to have all my doors and windows closed because of the kittens. And I'll leave it at that, Patty and Diego, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, so this is chapter 62, Be Delusional. Diego, I'm sorry, this is like the hundredth time you've heard this, but I love it. Number 62, Be Delusional. At 3 a.m., demons speak to all of us. I am old and they still speak to me every night and every day. They tell you that you're not good enough, that you didn't go to the right schools, that you're stupid, that you don't know how to draw, you don't have enough money, you're not original, and you and what you do doesn't matter, and who cares anyway? You don't even know art history, and you can't schmooze, and you have a really bad neck. They tell you that you're faking it, that other people see right through you, that you're lazy, that you don't know, that you don't know what you're doing, and that you're just doing this to get money and attention. Well, I have one solution to turn these demons away. After beating yourself up for a good half hour or hour or so, stop and then say out loud, yeah, but I'm a fucking genius. And you are too. You know the rules. The rules are your tools. Now go use them to change the world and get to work. So that was from Jerry Saltz. Thank you. My darlings, thank you so much for being here tonight. I so enjoyed having you. I'm so grateful that you gave us this time and that you showed up and thank you all three of you for this beautiful contribution. And I will uh, send a little email out. Lizzie, if, if you don't mind if I get your email address from Patty, awesome. Uh, and I'll send all of you an email. And uh, yeah, if uh, Lizzie, I'll send you the link for tomorrow's On the Threshold if you'd like to join us. But um, again, I'm just so grateful that all of you were here and I'm gonna leave you with this quote from one of my favorite writers, Tony Hoagland. And Tony says, some people think the truth is the worst thing that can happen. The truth is not the worst thing that can happen. So I'll say good night, everyone. Thank you so much and I'll see you soon. Good night. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.